This is a home interview, 511 Roby Avenue, Syracuse, New York. Uh, it is the 17th of January, 2003. Interviewers are Michael Russert, Wayne Clark, approximately 11.30 a.m. Would you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yeah, uh, Joseph A. Robichard. Uh, date of birth is June the 6th, 1920. In Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, what, can, what was your educational background prior to entering military service? I had one year of high school, and uh, at that particular time was the Depression years. <clears throat> and I had to. I loved school, but my brother got me a job and to help up help at the house, which I did, you know, and it didn't last too long, six months, and I was up, but I never did go back to school, see, even though I did like it, I never went back. Mm -hmm. I used to like the sports and that. Where were you, and what do you remember when you heard about what happened at Pearl Harbor? Uh, every Sunday, I've got a cousin that I eventually ran into in Italy, mm -hmm. but uh, we were coming back from this park. We always went to this park, about three, four of us, every Sunday. We'd walk up there and back, named Cogsall Park at Massachusetts. And uh, <clears throat> coming back, we were near this restaurant, this is a bar restaurant, and a lot of commotion was going on, so we didn't know what was happening. And uh, one guy went in there and they came out and said that Japan had bombed Pearl Harbor. And, you know, we were in shock. And I figured, well, we'll clean them up in about a week, you know, but mm -hmm. it wasn't to be. They were well prepared. <laughs> but that's where we were when we came back, see, from that day. Four or five of us. Mm -hmm. Did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I enlisted uh, a month and a week after Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. January 14th and uh, 42. What branch of service did you... Uh... The funny thing about it, I enlisted for the Air Corps and I went to Boston, passed all the tests, fiscal, mental, written, mm -hmm. and uh, of course at that particular time the Air Force was part of the Army. Mm -hmm. So from what I understand they filled up the Air Force and I got stuck in the Army and I got stuck. Uh, we used to hear about this Camp Croft, South Carolina, which is an infantry basic center, training center. And we used to hear about that, and I used to say to myself, I'm glad I'm not going there. Which I eventually <laughs> ended up going there because this buck sergeant, you know, up in Fort Devon, Mass. Uh, used to be Camp Devons then, but it's, it's a Fort Devons. And uh, buck sergeant woke me up, and he says, Roby shot us. I says, yes. He says, up and at him, he says, you're on your way to Croft. I says, not me. I'm going to camp. I'm going to camp something Missouri. It's an Air Force base. He says, he says, Croft, you're going. You know, that sort of let me down some. Because mm -hmm. my intentions were getting into the Air Force. And when I went down, well, finally I went down there and uh, uh, I reported uh, downtown in the army, then we were uh, trained, I believe, either trained, not bus, but trained to Fort Devens, Mass, or Camp Devens then. And uh, from there we were brought into the Boston Army Post. That's where we took all our physicals and all that. And uh, Passed everything. 
went back to Devon's. I think it was on a train that we took. And of course we're given uniforms and what have you, you know. And I only live 12 miles from there, my hometown, see. Uh -huh. uh, I think it's about 12 miles, Fitchburg, Mass, was from, Fort, from Camp Devens. And, and my people came up, I called them up and told, you know, where I was when they came up to see me that Sunday. And stayed there a couple of days, then down to Camp Croft, South Carolina, we went by train. And I found I had a lot of guys like me, you know. They weren't too happy, but so, you know, you, you will run into that kind of people, you know, that they were grabbed. But I, I volunteered. I figured I'd get what I wanted, which I didn't get. It was a little, a big disappointment for me, let's put it that way, but I figured, you know, hey, I'm in here, I was sworn in, I got to do or keep my mouth shut or get in trouble. And my brother actually was just about ready, uh, he was on that one year's compulsory service, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, they, they used to go in the army for one year, then they come out, and he was ready to come out in about a week and a half or two, and he told me the whole works what the army was all about. He said, keep your mouth shut, you won't get in trouble. Open it, you're asking for trouble. So I always had that in mind if I, so I learned to keep my mouth shut real early. <laughs> which, was which was hard to do, but I did. <laughs> but uh, you know, because I had gotten that big disappointment, not going where I wanted to go and ending up up there, but you know, once you get in there, and especially in a basic training, you run into people like you are, you know. And uh, I finally adjusted to it. It was it was a rough training set, let's believe you'll be there, Camp Croft. And uh, uh, who the heck was it? Oh yeah, then uh, before I left Devon's, let me see here. Now I, I'm thinking about Patton. Now he came after that, so that came later, General Patton. So from Croft, and uh, I got my f 16 weeks or whatever basic training. Then I was shipped back to Devon's. That I, we didn't know who it was, but it was the 45th Infantry Division. I came out of Colorado, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. That's an NG outfit, National Guard. And that's the outfit I was put into. Uh, I was actually, because I had played about 12 years in drum corps, playing the bugle and valve bugle and that, see. Mm -hmm. So going into basic training, they put me into what they call runner school. That's what your band's people, I, I, was, I wasn't in a band, I was a bugler of Company G, of the 180th Infantry, you know, the 45th Division. Mm -hmm. I was the bugler of that company. And uh, uh, well, Devon's, well, a lot of times I used to uh, we used to go out and practice, you know, the woods and all that. And usually I was put in charge because I had a lot of bugling. And yeah, of all the buglers, you know, once in a while we'd have a couple of guys play bugle and we'd play poker. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little sneaky thing, see. But one day a lieutenant came by and caught us. And my gosh, you know, we figured we're in deep trouble. And uh, he asked us where we were and all that. And I gave him a fake company. I didn't give him my company. But we never heard about it from that time on. Never heard about it, you know, what was that we were caught playing poker. Well, we were supposed a couple of guys were playing the horn, you know. The 
people. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, no, once we got in Devon's uh, with that 45th, uh, it, it was a rough outfit. I mean, that, I don't know, some 24 different tribes of Indians, I believe, in that division. And you had your cowboys, too. And uh, when I walked in there, it was like a rainy day. And, you know, going in from a basic into an outfit like that, and you see these guys, they were, the, they were dark, you know, the engines and that, they were there polishing their uh, uh, bayonets and cleaning their guns up. And I said to myself, what the hell did I get into here, you know? <laughs> I couldn't figure this out. But, you know, I would have never gone overseas with anyone but that, that bunch. Because, I mean, you could trust them. And uh, if you were their friends, but never, you never got against them. Because uh, most of them guys carried knives. Where they put them, I don't know. But they used to carry them with them. <laughs> and... Uh, one time coming back on a bus, she from Air Mass, which is a little town outside of Fort Devens, some commotion took place in a bus. A couple of GIs and that, probably drinking and all that. And uh, one knife came out, but nobody got knife, but the bus driver, who was an army guy, when he got up to the gate, he told the MPs, they looked throughout that bus and they never could find that knife. Never. They looked and looked and looked and looked. So it's uh. But after staying there for about pit near, I'd say, I know my mother used to tell us uh, that there used to be uh, a lot of GIs. My section of town, which was a French French section of about some twelve thousand people. See. Another section had Italians, another one had Greek, that Greek town. But the, the patch was the Italian. West Fitchburg was the Irish section. And uh, Leighton Street was Finnish. And, and she used to say, they used to see a lot of GIs, you know. And all at once they disappeared. They didn't see anymore. Once our outfit moved up there, that was it. I mean, that. <laughs> There was something, you know, uh, they wouldn't take crap from anyone, in other words. Well, you take Indians and that, all the different tribes. So it's, uh, but after we stay, I stayed there, for, let's say, for about, put there six months or seven, eight months. And from Devons, we moved to, uh, which was Pine Camp, presently called Fort Drums, New York, up in Watertown. Uh, upstate here. So that's when I moved up here with the outfit. Came into Syracuse uh, one weekend. Just just around Thanksgiving time, I believe, in 40, 42, we moved up there. And uh, we we're going to Canada. Uh, I had two other guys that we were at the bus station or the train station. We ran into some of the guys from our basic training asking us where we were going, so I told him, uh, we told him that we're going to, uh, you know, to Kingston, Ontario, that's what it was, we're going to go up there to dance and all that, you know, and they said, well, why don't you come to Syracuse with us? Never heard of Syracuse, so, so they finally convinced us to come to Syracuse, which we did, and went down, and we were down the armory downtown, they are on Jefferson Street Armory, across the street there's a hotel, and uh, we got our hotel that we asked the guy downstairs, the clerk, where the dance hall was, which he told us, Snell's, which was where the uh, state, the Chinese building is on Salina and Warren. On You kept going down Salina about a couple of blocks down, the dance hall was there. So we went down there, and the dance hall, we had to go upstairs to go in the dance hall. And you had to have a necktie to go in, they wouldn't let, Anyone without a necktie in that place. So we went up there and 
met the wife, the first one I danced with, I saw a cute kid across there, and I said, I'll go ask her to dance, which I did. And I figured she'd probably tell me no. And she did, and danced all night with her. Took her home up on Spring Street in Syracuse here. Got invited back the next day for dinner, which I appreciated, because <laughs> I slept on a YMCA downtown, see. And kept coming in every weekend until finally the middle of, I think, uh, January sometime, we were told that we were moving out of Pine Camp because we came up here actually for winter training, but the snow was so bad in Watertown that we couldn't go out and train or sleep out, see. And uh, they finally decided to shove us down in Camp Pickett, Virginia. And I gave her a call telling her that that we were confined, that we were we couldn't tell her what we, that we were moving out. You know that sort of you know military secret, whatever it was. And I says I couldn't come in this weekend, and that was it. And then I just kept corresponding with her once we got transferred to Pickett, Virginia. That's where the Blue Ridge Mountains are, and in fact where the natural bridges we maneuvered around that. And I believe uh, down the bottom, on the right side, George Washington's initials is written there, and it's still there. I believe it's still there today. But, you know, we were in awe about that, that he had put that on that, see. So we maneuvered down there, and in fact, uh, overhead from that bridge is this main highway, and one of our GI trucks went over, and... I don't know how many GIs get killed, you know, they were, that, that was quite a, you know, quite a fall. But uh, then we, from there we went into uh, uh, Newport News, we were about ready. Uh, we did mountain training there too, by the way, in Pickett. And uh, those hillbillies up there were something else. Uh, they used to say, you expect the war to come on? You know that old hillbilly talk. <laughs> we said, "When the hell do you, Where did these guys come from?" <laughs> they were mountain boys, you know. So you know we played along with them and all that stuff. But uh, we found it very, you know, very interesting and funny. So finally, we uh, left the Blue Ridge Mountain. Then we went to. Uh, Camp Miles Stanish, which is a, a port of embarkation and debarkation, I believe, in, uh, way down the coast of Virginia. And from there, we stayed there maybe a few days and we hauled overseas. We were right in the harbor, see. And the funny thing about it, when I we were on that ship, where the whole, uh, our whole division was there, the whole 45th Infantry Division, see. And all the training that we got, we had mountain training. We had, we we also went to Cape Cod when we were in Fort Evans for amphibious training and that. See, and we went through the whole works, mountain, amphibious, and that. And finally, when we went to Camp Pickett to Camp Pickett, Virginia, then we hauled overseas, and uh, we're going through. What's the uh, that channel that goes between, you can see uh, Spanish Morocco on uh, uh, Spain on the left and Spanish Morocco on the, on the right. On the Straits of Gibraltar. The Straits of Gibraltar, that's the one. You know, some of these things, really, we went right through that, we could see that, see. Now, did you go overseas in a convoy? Yes, the whole 45th Division. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they used to tell us uh, uh, once in a while, uh, I know they had U-boats, mm -hmm. but whenever they had one, they said, oh, no, it's, it's nothing. But we could see our destroyers. We had our fleet with us, destroyers and cruisers. We'd see the destroyers take right off, you know, where they were and drop these depth charges. Mm -hmm. But they would say, no, it's not no, it's not U-boats and that's he. Of course, they didn't want to, you know, stir up the people. And... Uh, And that's uh, 
that was going over she then finally went into the Strait of Gibraltar and then we uh, went into Oran Harbor that's in North Africa mm -hmm. and we did a little amphibious training up there too we stayed there we went in set up our pup tents and uh, went out and I did some amphibious training and uh, we could see the planes our planes you know from Africa going into bomb you know Europe and all that you know so we didn't know where they were going, but I imagine they were softening up Sicily, because that's the place that once we left the harbor in Oran, we headed for, and they had a major storm, and they didn't know whether they were going to call that storm off or not. She had a kind of the, uh, you know, the weather and that with all the ships and that, but the storm sort of ceased, you know, let up. And uh, finally, uh, we got, which we could see our uh, cruisers and our destroyers uh, from the, you know, shelling around, around that Gila coast, Sicilian coast, which is around Gila, which, were, which I believe that's where we were supposed to go inland, see, mm -hmm. and we could see the them, you know, shelling the hell out of it, and they'd be, uh, they were throwing shells at us, and I got seasick, and believe you me, you know, them, I don't know what you call the LCIs or LFCs, they open up from the back, and of course I was over, you know, thrown up and all that, and my captain, Captain Otto Butler from Oklahoma, he was a pure Indian. As throwing up, he kept pulling me down. He says, he called me right on the head. He says, you want to get your head blown off? I says, I told him, I, says, I don't give a damn. Because, I mean, I was, you know, seasick. And uh, nothing was coming out. <laughs> so that was one experience. And finally, we went down the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the nets for the invasion. She, uh, while they were shelling, we... Uh, we were down, and then we came out. We could see the shells going on shore, and some of the shells were coming by. Uh, so we finally got into the these landing crafts and headed for shore. And uh, finally, those crafts hit dirt, see, which was still maybe about this much of water, see. So the back end went off, and we started going off. Then my stomach felt just like a, a million bucks again. I had no, you know, that, that we went in, but we didn't encounter anything funny in landing. We went in the, into the beach, and uh, finally, you know, they start. I got in with my unit. What I was, I was a runner for Company G. Every company had two runners that went to the battalion. And uh, we'd communicate from the battalion to our company, whatever message that the major or the colonel had to give, that was our job to get to them. And, uh, oh, when we landed, yeah, so we went in, then we went up on a, they call them hills, but they were mountains. On the right side, as we went in, see, we went inland and went on top of the mountains. And uh, we could see the harbor. Now, at once, across from us had another mountain. They call them hills. Then the German tanks start coming around there, which they couldn't see us. We were up in the mountains, the trees, and all that. And then uh, our, our major contacted the ship, the uh, destroyers, the cruisers, and started giving them instructions where the tanks were coming from around the corner. Mm -hmm. And they start firing. Of course, if these Germans would have knew where we were and where that information was coming from, quite sure they would have blast the hell out of it. It wouldn't have taken much with those 88s that they had. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, 
they kept and uh, the major kept telling them and eventually they knocked out I think a couple of their tanks finally the rest retreated back around the around that mountain see because uh, uh, our ships had knocked out a couple of them see and uh, then the Germans planes were coming in those uh, there's a one pilot plane I don't know what they call it Messer space I don't know what but you could see the pilot where we were, you know, with his stick and all. Of course, if he would have seen us too, then we could see him in the valley going in towards the harbor to throw bombs at the ship, which he did bomb one of the ship. We could see it. He set it on fire, see. And, uh, well, that lasted so long. And uh, from there, I think we, uh, that was in, uh, well, we kept going, okay. Uh, what we'd do, uh, we'd walk, let's say, five miles, then sit down for about 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I don't know which, get a little shut eye, up and go again. And we kept doing that. And then we finally ran into a big retaining wall. And, uh, with a big building up there, so well, we figured we didn't know what it was. But what we found out later, we landed into a German command post. <laughs> and <laughs> of course, with that wall, then they had like that, you know, that opening like this, you know, where I imagine in the window, whatever it was. And uh, I could hear them damn bullets coming through that. Once the Germans found that we were there, they started opening fire, and I could hear bullets coming through. And this buck sergeant was telling me, he says, right on, he said, right, he says, shoot at the house through this thing. And I says to myself, yeah, okay, Sarge. I said, if you think I'm going to stick my head there, because I could hear bullets coming, you could hear, whing, you know. I says, uh-uh. <laughs> so he went away, and I says, Bull, I could I could tell you better bull crap, but I I'll be more <laughs> respectable. So finally, we were told to withdraw. The, you don't retreat in the army; you withdraw. That's the way the American army works. So uh, we did, and finally, I was I went back, and I ended up in a wood. The, the other guys went that away, this away, and all that, and I ended up in the woods, and I couldn't find no one. You know, and I said to myself, where are the troops? So eventually, I ran into a, a, a paratrooper. I believe it was either the first or the third or second or third airborne division. He was a paratrooper. He was lost. So... He, had, he was looking for an outfit. He couldn't find it, so we got together. Then we ran into a sergeant medic. He was in the same position as we were. So, you know, he couldn't find a unit, so the three of us stuck together. And we uh, traveled in the daytime and slept in these gullies at night, see? And... Uh, Finally, I, uh, we went traveling. We saw a farmhouse, uh, you know, from where we were. And uh, this house was there. And all at once, this woman came out. And then we start looking towards him, you know. We got up. Then she started yelling, Americano. And we kept telling her, keep your mouth shut, because we didn't know what the hell the Germans were. And then she kept running, was happy and all that, and the daughter came. And uh, finally, uh, when they came, we asked where the Germans were, and they told us <coughs> Germans had left. They were in, in the back of their home, they had went out that way in the woods and all, they had left early in the morning, see. So we felt pretty secured. And... Uh, I had a black onyx, a ring, that we appreciated the people, you know, telling us where the Germans had left and all that, so we could go back to our, where our outfits were. And so I gave 
uh, the young girl, my black onyx, and the uh, paratrooper gave, <clears throat> on top of their uh, parachute, when they land, they get a little pure silk parachute. <clears throat> and he had that, <clears throat> and he gave that to the mother in appreciation also. Then finally, uh, we sort of separated, and I started going towards the Biscari Airport. <coughs> and uh, going to the Biscari Airport uh, that our troops, what we heard, had captured. And, uh, well, we, we, we saw we saw the GIs walking up, so we got in line. Well, the, the medic went in. He ran into a medic outfit that he went in with them. The paratrooper ran into some trooper. Uh, he found out where some of the paratroopers were, and he went his way, medic that way, and I went, I followed these GIs, figuring that if they captured the Biscari Airport, my division had to be in that, which was the 45th Infantry Division, see, which they were part of capturing that airport. And uh, in fact, uh, before we even got there, I was telling you in a gully once, there we saw uh, what they call a, a railroad station. You know, the building and all that. We saw a German tank up there. And uh, one of us got wise and said, why don't we go up there and take one of our, uh, what the hell do you call them, uh, them little, uh, pull the pin out. A grenade? grenade? Grenade, yeah. Go out there and throw it down the turret. You know, starting to think, you know, after that happened, you know, we, we, we start thinking, my God, he says, what the hell would that grenade would have done to that turret? So uh, we decided finally not to go. And that's when we went into the Biscari Airport. We sort of split up. Then... Uh, Finally, I ran into my uh, captain, Captain Butler, and he was about ready to send notice that I was missing in action. They go to the regiment, uh, I mean, uh, battalion regiment, then the division, then it comes in D.C., then they notify our people that, you know, we're lost and uh, missing in action. And... Uh, he says, you just made it, he said, because I was just about ready to turn you in as missing in action, which. So then uh, we stayed and uh, then we started going. Well, we like I was saying, we'd move, uh, walk five miles, sleep about five, ten minutes, get up, walk. We kept doing that until we ran into this, uh, like this one building I told you about there. So after that, uh, there's so much that took place. I know one time they sent me out. Uh, when I finally joined the company, the captain was glad to see me. He called me right on the head. He said, I was about ready to report your mission in action and all that. And uh, uh, I got a Start thinking here. Uh, yeah, okay. So we finally would start moving. Then we went into this tunnel, uh, railroad tunnel. And uh, when I got up there, that I found out that my captain had gotten killed uh, on, a, on a mountainside next to us. They call him Hill, but on the mountainside. And, you know, I was very close to my, you know, he was, to me, he was a, quite a guy, you know, that butler, Captain Butler, Otto Butler. And uh, we, uh, I wanted to go see him, but we slept in that tunnel all night. And before, you know, the next morning came, uh, next morning came, the, uh, in the front came about five or six Italians with weapons. And they gave themselves up. And they told us they were at the other end of the tunnel. They knew we were there. I mean, they, they could have killed all of us. 
because we never knew what, you know, they were down the other end, and they just came around, gave us all their weapons, and gave up, see? So we were very fortunate. We could have been all killed there with a grenade or anything like that, see? So, uh, and from then we started going towards uh, Palermo, which was the capital of uh, Sicily. And uh, finally we took the island over after 38 days, I believe. And we were in a rest and a staging area, resting area that we then uh, all at once uh, we're getting ourselves ready for another one. Did you ever see Patton while you were in Sicily? Yeah. Uh, he talked to us in Fort Devens before we came to Pine Camp, New York, mm -hmm. the whole division. That was after the African campaign. He brought a tank with him. And he showed us the tank, you know, and I don't know if you want cussing, but every three or four words, he'd have a, a cuss word. You don't accept cusses, do you? No, that's fine. It's okay. Because he'd say, uh, when you're, if you capture those goddamn Hun Germans, he says, kill them, he says. He says, because the food, they give them maybe the food that you're supposed to have, you won't have it. He killed the son of a bitch. Which, to, uh, to me, at least, I don't know about the other guy, I, I didn't... To me, if you're a PW, you're a PW. But to him, I mean, he... When they say blood and guts, he was. Every three or four words was a goddamn or a son of a bitch or whatever it was. Uh, so finally... Uh, The figure, I know, I know. He did. This was up in Fort Devon. He had brought that up there. Well, anyway, that's about what he was telling you. You know, if you run into the guy, you know, don't take any PWs, which was a bad thing because that outfit was bloodthirsty that we were in. Well, to my opinion, maybe they weren't, but I mean, to me, uh, and when we started, I hope the hell uh, nobody gets in trouble on this. But when we started, we took no prisoners. Uh, they'd grab, grab guys that uh, go in the back, you could see shooting. But that, we always figured Patton's the one that told the guys, you didn't have to tell these guys that twice. Because <clears throat> they were blood, you know, and they would shoot them. And I still think, I still think what happened around Bustong and all that. You remember when all them GIs were getting shot and all that? That mm -hmm. somewhere along the line, this buster came up. The Germans must have seen that or something. That no prisoners were taken then at the early part of the Sicilian campaign until Washington got wind of that and they put a stop to it. Mm -hmm. In, f <clears throat> in fact. Uh, I believe, when was it? Patton was relieved of his command. In Sicily, I believe. And he was sent. Oh, that's when he slapped that GI. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Were, were any of the soldiers aware of that happening? Oh, yeah. We, we knew. And, uh, uh, when Patton, uh, well, Patton was in a hospital in Africa, I believe, and he asked one of the GIs up there, you know, one guy had a leg off or an arm or something like that, he looked at him and he felt sorry for him. And then the guy next to him was just, you look perfect health, you know, and uh, that we got, we got wind of. And he says, how about you, son? He says, what's wrong with you? So the GI says battle fatigue. And Patton, whatever it was, that's when he slapped that GI, see, in the face. Boy, he had to apologize world, worldwide for that, for that incident. That's when he got relieved of his command over there. And he was sent to England. 
and I believe uh, Clark, I think it was Clark, I can't remember, that took over the uh, whole things up there, you know, of command. Uh, but uh, to me, that wasn't right, you know, that you've done that, and I still think in the latter year in war, maybe not, because I know they killed a lot of our GIs up there, you know, when they invaded from England, mm -hmm. that they fought a lot of them. That could have been seen, or, you know, I don't know that. I'm not going to say yes, I'm not going to say no, I don't know. But uh, I don't think, to my opinion, that should have been done. I mean, if you're a PW, treat them as PWs. But uh, they got the word, and you didn't have to tell these guys that twice, because they were bloodthirsty. I mean, they were, well, that's what we were training, you know. So anybody that surrendered, they, they just shot them? They shot them at first until Washington got wind of it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that put a stop to that real quick. That's when Patton got relieved, I believe, of his command. I'm not quite sure, but I think that was the incident that some of the, the guys were told, you know, well, we were told, you know, get rid of them. Take no PWs. So it's, uh, and from there we, uh, when that ended, that we went into uh, uh, Solano, Italy, uh, from Messina, uh, from Palamo. Yeah, we went around into the, that straight there, then we went right into Solano. And uh, that's when Mussolini gave up. We heard that his people had captured him up north with his girlfriend. They hung him in a square up by Milan somewhere, if I'm not mistaken. And they, had him, they hung him upside down. So they figured that we'll go right into Salado, you know. The Italians gave up then, you know, when that happened. They gave up. But the Germans got wind of it, and they took over all their positions in Salano and Italy. So, so we did, you know, uh, some of the guys were starting to go in, and all hell broke loose. The Germans had taken over the positions, which we thought we could probably just walk right into and take it over. So... That was quite an affair in Salado, and finally we got in there, you know. Uh, planes came in, and ships started shelling the shores where those guns were coming from, and then we finally went in there. And we went into the mountains up there, and uh, uh, that's where General Clark, I think, he came up Thanksgiving. It was around Thanksgiving time. He came up there, and... Uh, had turkey with us in the mountains. Of course, you know, cameras were there. Had a turkey, he took a piece of turkey, he took off as quick as that turkey went down his throat. <laughs> but then my, uh, my mother wrote to me saying, oh, we see that your general is up there having Thanksgiving with you. <laughs> yeah, he came and he went. But that was good, you know, Think for the U.S., see? Clark, each Thanksgiving with his troops. <laughs> so that, you know, that was quite a laughable thing for us, see? <laughs> so, so finally, uh, we have eventually, you know, uh, we weren't doing much moving because uh, the Germans were in stronghold. They were up by Mount Casino as one. And that's a monastery, and where bunks and all that were. And in the mountain, the hell, they, they probably had enough food up there even to last up to three. See, the Germans were there, and our planes bombed the hell out of the place, and all the trees and everything were all knocked down. And the Germans had OPs on top of the mountain, and our troops. Every time they go up, where well, they killed a lot of our troops, see, because they could see them. And finally, we stayed there for quite a while around that casino and the, in a mountaintop until they decided, well, we're not getting any place here. So somebody came up in a rear race line, a general, whoever, Clark or whoever it was, to make another landing, which we did up at Anzio Beachhead. And uh, uh, we, we went up there the fourth day after the landing 
the initial landing, our bunch, and uh, once we got up there, then we, uh, some of our guys went right into Rome, which that wasn't too far from Rome. They uh, they went in with jeep right into Rome, and with no opposition. And finally they came back, figured, hey, we're getting into a trap. And when we did come back, this major general of ours, whoever, I can't remember who the hell it was, but he says, dig in, which was the worst thing, because we could have gone right in taking Rome then. So we dug in, the Germans start reinforcing their troops. They, had, they took some of the troops off the Western Front, you know, and they brought them in Italy, and... Uh, Hitler gave the order to knock us off that beach at all cost at the Angio. And uh, that's when the troops from uh, Casino, the German troops, withdrew. Because once we got into that, see, so they wouldn't get trapped. Because I think their, uh, their objection was to go across the peninsula and trap that whole bunch of Germans that were in Casino. Which, like I was saying, they'd still be there today because they had food that they were way down in the mountains up there because you know so that's that's what happened then see but eventually they did withdraw and they got out of casino and once up in Anzio the uh, uh, we we lost quite a few troops up there quite a quite a bit uh, they had a place they called a factory up there and uh, you get up there we had I can't remember what the heck it was that they uh, anyway they well we stayed there for a while then finally we start we start attacking the break out on Angio and uh I was at an OP, what they call OP, it's an observation point, post, uh, with the runners. We were two runners per company, and a shell fell up there, and it killed about, I don't know, I'd say two, three, or four of our runners on the shell. And I got knocked out. When I woke up, I was going back to the rear evacuation, and one of those, you know, the big, what do you call them? GI trucks that they carry the troops in. Uh, deuce and a half? Deuce and a half Whatever deuce and a half it was. Ton truck. Uh, yeah, and and that's where I woke up going back, and finally I ended up up in uh, up in Asia on the beachhead. They took us there on a ship to Naples. Finally, going into Naples, uh, we were sent to. Oran Africa, from Oran Africa, landed back in Newport News, Virginia. Newport News, Virginia, uh, was sent to Fort Devens. My mother didn't know, my parents didn't know about that. And finally I called my godmother from my hometown in Fitchburg to tell my parents that I was at Fort Devens, that I would be home late that day. Because I didn't want to walk in on them. Because mm -hmm. they thought I was still overseas as far as they were concerned. So, you know, it was too much of a shock. And then when I went, uh, finally, when I uh, left Devens, I took the bus into Fitchburg. Going into Fitchburg, I got off the bus. And I'm getting ready to go on to another bus where it took us to our French district. And I ran into my second oldest brother down there. You know, and I'm looking at him. He they used to call me by my middle name because my uncle's name lived next door to us was Joe. And they used to call me Albert. So it would be a Joe. Every time they yelled Joe, he'd answer. <laughs> so <laughs> they called me Albert and... Uh, he yelled at me, Albert, he said, what are you doing here? And I just came back, so I just come back. So he didn't know that I had come back. So we took the bus together. Of course, my parents knew because my aunt called my mother up.
telling her that I was coming in, see. And uh, finally, we took the bus to my section, which is Claygarn. It's a French section of Ma Fitchburg, Mass. And it was quite a reception, you know, with my parents and all that, tears and what have you, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so from then, but I kept communicating with my girlfriend all the time because we had got, I had gotten engaged before I left Syracuse when I was in Pine Camp to her. And I sent her a ring from uh, uh, when we were in uh, Camp Malastanish. And the funny thing about it, I had the money to buy the ring. And uh, when I went back to the camp, I'm, I'm watching this poker game going on upstairs in the room. Now, these people, maybe still up to today, think that I got into that poker game, which I never did get into it. That wallet was either stolen out of me or something. I sat down, it was gone. I had all my money, and I had to send to my send my mother a message to send me money so I could buy my girlfriend an engagement ring, <laughs> which she did. And uh, finally, I sent it up, and she kept corresponding with me all the time, I, which which is a good thing for me, you know, you know, getting and. Uh, because well, unless you uh, unless you get into a war, you don't realize, you know, what the situation is. I know you guys probably were in. I don't know, but I mean, if you're not, you know, if you're not in, you never know if the next shell is going to hit you or not. Let's put it that way. Because one time when I I was carrying a message, I was running in this field at night. This was at night time. Uh, I stumble over a guy. And all at once I see a pair of eyes looking at me. It was a dead German. I went, Oop, you know. <laughs> he was dead, but it sort of shocked me. <laughs> then uh, another time, uh, this, this, was at, this was at night too. They must have saw, another time when I delivered a message, they must have saw my shadow at night. Because they start shelling that open field that I was at. And then I had a tree. I, I think the trunk was about this big. And I'm holding on to that as if it was, I was holding on to a, a house or something, you know. And I held on. I could hear them shells hitting. Of course, when they told us in basic training, when it's shelling, never move. Stay where you are. The one that will hit you, you'll never, you'll never know. And the one you will hear will scare the hell out of you, which actually did. And I stayed there, and I could hear them shell, and I could hear them firing. Not only once you could hear that, you know, zzz, then the damn thing would explode. And finally, I says, well, if they had any prayers that I forgot, I believe you, I remember them. I prayed my heart out. <laughs> finally, when I heard that gun not firing anymore, I took off. Believe you me, I think Jesse Owens didn't have nothing on me. I took right off, you know, where I was supposed to go, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it was a weird, weird feeling. But uh, I used to say to myself, I wonder what heaven, if I go there, what would it look like or what, you know. I mean, the craziest thoughts you had, you know, not knowing because one of them could have hit me because they were hitting all around me. Why I never got hit, I don't know, but, but, uh, that was that one experience as a runner that I had. We had others, but I can't, you know, it's, uh, that's too many that you, you know, you can't remember them all of them. But uh, uh, when I came back, that, like I was saying, I landed in Devon, then I went to see my people, stayed there for about two, three days in Fitchburg, which was about 10, 10 12, 30 miles from Fort Devon, so Camp Devon. Then I came up here to Syracuse, told the girlfriend, you know, I called her up and told her I was coming in. She was my, we were engaged to get married, so we came up here. We set a wedding date. And then uh, I think I had about a month, a month's vacation that I had. Uh, so in the meantime, I got, we got married, which was real quick. 
And, uh, yeah, there's a month off I had. We got married. Then we went, uh, my uh, wife's uncle was, he was a, some sort of a head salesman for some, I can't remember what outfit he worked for. But anyway, he had a lot of influence. So on the honeymoon night, he got us a hotel, the Onondaga Hotel, which is demolished now, which you couldn't get. He got us rooms there. We stayed there overnight, went back to her folks, and uh, we eventually went to New York City, Times Square Ho uh, Hotel. I don't know if you ever heard of that place. It's right in Times Square. Uh, Lexington Hotel? Hotel Lexington? I, I, well, it's it's in there. I don't know what the heck. But we did go in there, and uh, uh, when we were there, the war in Europe, right in Times Square, Hitler gave up, or whatever it was. And uh, uh, that was quite a thing to see the people celebrating, see? And uh, from... Uh, and we stayed there for, oh, maybe, uh, but we did get a message. She did call her parents, and they said that I got a uh, thing to report back to Camp Butler, North Carolina. Of course, they told them that we were on a honeymoon, so I told them, don't tell them where. So, you know, so I went back, you know, to, came back to Syracuse up here. Then I did have to report back to Camp Butler, North Carolina. See, that was a that's a reassignment center. Then from there we went to uh, Camp Edwards, now Fort Evans, no Fort Devens. Then we went. What the hell was it? The Boston Army Post. All right, they wanted to make an MP out of me, and I found out you had you got no passes. Every six months they may give you a day off or something like that. You were, you were on duty all the time, right in Boston. I said, this isn't for me. I said, i got to get the hell out of this thing. Finally, when I went up there, you know, the, <laughs> the lieutenant, I went inside, you know, there's your office and all that. He's telling me and all that. And he says, you'll have to carry a 45 and all that. And, and I says, uh, uh, there's a captain at the desk. The captain, I says, I'm a... Uh, Allergic to weapons. You know, that worked. <laughs> because from, from then, <laughs> they pushed me back to Camp Miles Standish. <laughs> that, that I could, you know, I could go home. I had just gotten married. I wasn't about ready to get my ass stuck, you know, for six months. You know, I don't even go home. So, so I get out of that. And I was in the Boston Army Post. And, uh, then I was sent from there to, uh, uh, what the hell was it, uh, Cape Cod, that camp up there. What the heck's that? There's a, a, a photo camp up there in Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. uh, towards Cape Cod, there's, what the hell was it? Anyway, well, that's where I got... I got discharged from that place anyway. Mm -hmm. I'll, can, uh, I'll think of it, but that—that's where I was when the uh, when the war ended and all that. And in fact, I was walk I was walking in a, in a t little town up there in the USO club. We come out there. We heard that Japan had given up and all that. See, and then uh, just oh, a week and a half or something like that later, maybe two. That's when I get totally discharged because I enlisted for duration plus six months but they didn't they didn't know what the heck to do with us so I got a, a discharge and I came up here and I've been up here ever since that, that was Why my that, uh, two minutes left. Okay. that was what, my, what uh, was your reaction when you heard about the the death of Frank of President Roosevelt we felt real bad real real bad mm -hmm. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's hard to describe it, you know, because 
uh, actually he was our leader. You know, you forget uh, your father's, your household. He was our leader of all the, you know, and uh, we felt real bad about him, you know, passing away that way, but. What did you think of the atomic bomb? Were you happy that they dropped it, or how did you feel? Uh, it was a mixed feeling. In a way, I hated to see a, a, a city and all these people destroyed, but it did save millions of our GIs from getting killed. If we would have landed in Japan, I'm quite sure because they're, uh, they're you know, uh, it's a, I don't know, at that particular time they were fanatics or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. then they would have they stayed there till the last one get killed. And I know we would have lost a lot of people if we would have went into Japan itself, see. Mm -hmm. So in a way it was, it was a bad thing, but still it was a good that saved a lot of our GIs' mm -hmm. lives in that, see. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, it's, uh, if Japan would have had it, it would have threw it at us, there's no doubt. But that's the same what's going on today. Seconds, do you want to? Um, there was something else, but I think it might be a little bit longer than that. You want to change tapes? Yeah, just go to another tape for real. We're going to go to. Hey guys, uh, he wrote to me, he said, Have you hit yet? Choo choo. He said, Because, of course, at that time, ACAC was, that was a racket, mm -hmm. any aircraft. But they, when the Germans, made that big drive, they all became in there, they gave them all the guns, see. Mm. <laughs> well, one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned here when you were in uh, <clears throat> Sicily, you saw Bob Hope. Yes, Bob Hope and Francis Langford, Francis mm -hmm. Langford, and a guy by the name of Smart, he was a guitarist, I can't remember his first name, Smart, uh, Smart or something like that. Yeah, Bob Hope came up there, well, he was... He, he was quite the guy, you know, he used to make quite a crack, and finally he made some crack, he, he looked at the whole bunch, you know, and he says, and when you guys, is, I see you guys are doing pretty good, he says, he says, when this is all over with, he says, I want you guys to look me up in Hollywood, he says, he says, I need protection, <laughs> you know, and it struck us funny, you know, mm -hmm. but, oh, the, the guy was fantastic, though, he was. I mean, uh, and Frances Langford was that singer. Mm -hmm. She sang, which was beautiful. Jack Smart was the guitarist with them. Um, did you ever use the GI Bill when you returned? Uh, I did, but I got into the wrong field. I got in what they call uh, uh, refinish it, you know, like furniture and all that stuff, I get into that field. But the guy I was working for down there was one of the tops in Syracuse, but all he had me do was errands, running here, running that, probably stripping a piece of furniture once in a while, you know. But the trade itself, he never gave me anything. Mm -hmm. So I eventually blew him in, you know, to the government and in case anybody else was sent there, that, that make sure that they wouldn't be sent mm -hmm. there. I, I won't mention the name, but it's downtown somewhere. It's, he's dead now anyway, so. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the only thing that I took advantage of, you Did know. Did you ever use that 5220 club? 5220 club? Uh, it's the, like unemployment insurance. Unemployment insurance, it was $20 a week for 52 weeks. I, I think I did a little, but not much of it. Mm -hmm. I did some, but not much of it. Do you ever join any veterans groups and uh, active and? Yes, because I'm in fact I've been the commander up here in East Syracuse of the VFW 3352. Uh, they're all up in age, and a lot of them are sickly. I'm one of the few healthy ones, and we seem to be keeping the same offices year in and year out because there's no one else that can take over the place. But uh, and then uh, I've been commanded with them for quite a while, 
And I also was commander of the Disabled American Vet, Chapter 5, I believe, in Syracuse. I became commander down there also. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's only, you know, for one year, see. So Do you uh, have any contact, keep contact with anyone that you served with at all? There's only one guy I kept contact with, and it was a runner pal of mine from Dundee, New York. Uh, we kept in contact with one another even after the war ended. He came up here, he got married, and uh, I wrote, or maybe after a year or so, or something like that, wrote to him, and I never got a response because he was working for that. Uh, what the heck, that plastic factory or something like that there that he worked for. And then I never heard from him anymore see, since that time. Whether he's dead now or whatever happened to him, I don't know. But he did live in Dundee, New York. Mm -hmm. and, uh, How do you think your uh, military service had an effect on your life? Well... You probably wouldn't have met his wife, right? <laughs> I wouldn't have met the wife, there's no doubt, because I would have never came up this part of the country. But the, the funny thing, you know, in civilian life, this was in peacetime, because I played a lot of sports, basketball, baseball, softball, and uh, I did a lot of uh, ice skating, uh, roller skating, uh, dancing, all that kind of stuff. I was very active. And uh, as far as, uh, you now you mentioned about how it affected my life, you yeah, say? How do you think it, what effect my, did it have on your life? You mean the war? Yes. Well, it was good in one way, not the other one. Because, uh, Uh, I'd say mostly good. Uh -huh. Yeah, mostly good. Yeah, yeah. No one's gonna go through life without running into a bad thing now and then. I don't care who he is. If he is, he's lying like hell. You don't want to tell the truth. <laughs> but uh, no, I uh, I enjoyed Syracuse. Enjoyed it very much. In fact, I've got a brother that's up here. He lives up here, you know, he's got his own business now, refinishing and that, so. Yeah. But that's my youngest brother. So we were nine in a family. Now, I, I see, looking into the bedroom, I see a, a Bronze Star Award. Yeah, I did get that. Uh, what did you get that for? Uh, I believe... They never gave me an explanation, but I know when I brought a message up in Angio, to my captain to pull the troops back because they were surrounded by three side by the Germans. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't get cut off. And I did bring that message and uh, they did withdraw. And that's the only thing I can figure that I did get that bronze star. Because, mm -hmm. you know, of course, being a runner too. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things I did, but, you know, that was life threatening all the time, no matter what. But uh, I, that I remember. That could have been it when the troop, because my company would have been cut right off and probably all captured if I wouldn't have got that message through. You know what I mean? Which was very important. So it's, uh, I got that after I came out of the service. But I imagine it was on record. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your yes. interview. Yeah. Thank you, sir.